please stand as I read the scripture. Uh, it's a two part Matthew 6, 1 through 6, and uh, 16 through 18. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, and their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. Thank you. All right. This is great. This is great. Uh, God is so good to us. He gives us alternate technology, huh? All right, redundant technology. I wanted to uh, start out this morning just by giving a plug. Many of you who live in the municipality of Anchorage have received a ballot in the mail. We in the United States have a unique privilege and opportunity to select those rulers who represent us. And uh, we often get really preoccupied with things on the national level. That's what gets all the press. That's where all the drama is. But our ability to affect change on a national level really is much, much smaller than our ability to affect change on a local level. So having said that, I encourage you to do some homework, investigate the platforms of those people who are running either for mayor or assembly, or for school board, and I would encourage you to vote and honor God with who you select. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, another thing I wanted to start out by saying is um, many of you know I have, um, I have uh, CAD. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's, a car it's uh, artery disease. What does, C what does C stand for? Cardiac? Cor coronary. <laughs> coronary artery disease. I got this thing. I have no idea what it's called, right? And so, and so I have to take a bunch of medications every day and, and so forth. And all the medications have, like, side effects. I have one medication that's a blood thinner. And so uh, that has side effects. I got another medication lowers my blood pressure. I've got one medication. I don't know which one it was, but it, it kind of causes my nose to run. You know, that's, isn't, isn't that a great side effect to have? So every once in a while, you may see me, like, do a little dab. That's to, that's to relieve you from whatever uncomfortable feelings you may have by watching someone up front have their nose run in front of you, right? That's actually for your benefit. And so uh, part of uh, having CAD is uh, you need to go to, or you, you have the opportunity to go to what, what we call is rehabilitation. And so I, three days a week, I go to Providence Medical Center, and I have, uh, I have cardio rehab. And for the most part, it's really a workout because there are many of my now peers who do not have a consistent regimen of exercise in their life. And the idea is to extend not only the duration but quality of life for those of us who have CAD by incorporating exercise. But they also give some instruction on diet and the benefit of your medications and so forth. Well, I've always, loved, I've always loved to work out. Who likes to work out here? Anyone? Okay, good, good. There's something about the release of endorphins. There's something about like working the body. Afterwards, there's this feeling of accomplishment. Uh, I almost feel like I have more control over my life after I've had a good workout. My, my body's more at peace. So I've always enjoyed the workout. And so when I go to cardio rehab, 
I get on the stationary bike. And I was on the stationary bike on Wednesday. And, uh, and I was doing what I call a heel workout, meaning I, I go and incrementally I just increase the resistance on that bike. And I get to the top of the hill. And I'm at the maximum level of resistance. And I'm going to be here for about six minutes. So I'm going to start pouring it on. And I do. I start pouring it on. And, and of course, everyone's wearing masks. And I got my mask on, and I'm pouring it on. All of a sudden, I feel my nose start running. OK? But this is OK, because I've, I've got the mask on, and the nose. And, and of course, when, you, when you're working hard at that peak level, you don't care what you look like. Right? You're, you're in there for a workout. You want the endorphins. And you know, that comes with sweat and tears, and it's kind of gross sometimes. So I just, I'm going to let it go. So I'm going to let that nose run. And it is a gusher. And so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm working, and I'm working, and I'm working. And what they do is after your peak level of exertion, they like to take your blood pressure. They want to they, they watch you. They're concerned about your health. And so they want to make sure you're not going to blow a gasket while you're there on, on the exercise bike. So, so I stop. Well, I don't stop. I finish my, my peak exertion uh, interval, and I raise my hand, and the lady comes over, takes my blood pressure. I said, can you get a towel? I'm just like sopping wet with, with sweat. So she gets me a towel, and I start, and of course, uh, you know, sweat accumulates on my head, and it's easy to sop that up nowadays. And so, uh, and then I take off the mask, because I want to sop up all this, uh, you know, all this stuff that's been going on here for the last six minutes. And so it's this white towel, and I'm sopping it up, and I look, and this was not mucus that was running out of my nose. I was taking a blood thinner, and I had a bloody nose, and this thing was a gusher. And now I had blood everywhere. I had blood on the towel. I had blood on my mask. And of course, all this ran down to my mouth. So my, it looks like someone just, just slugged me in the face, and I've got, it is, it is a bloody mess. And of course, like all the attendants there are really worried because cause they're worried that I might have blown a gasket. And, and so, well, you know, if this thing keeps gushing, you better go to the emergency room. And I, I never, ever would get, well, bloody noses, maybe once a year or something. But ever since I've had these blood thinners, I do get them maybe once a month, and they're really inconvenient. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I was the center of attention <laughs> there at cardio rehab. And, and sometimes being the center of attention is fun, right? Sometimes we like being the center of attention. Other times, we would much rather not be the center of attention. And this was an opportunity for me to not want to be the center of attention. Well, the short of the story is I went to the bathroom, and I got all the blood cleaned up, and I, you know, of course, held my nose, and, and it stopped. And I was able to kind of finish my workout. It was a disappointing workout day, but that's, that's a... That's my story of what happened to me on Wednesday. And so you're probably asking yourself, wow, Brad, that's a nice story. <laughs> uh, why, why on earth are you sharing this story with me? Well, oh boy. The reason I share this story with you is because um, the Pharisees like to be the center of attention. They like to be the center of attention. Uh, and... Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Pharisees. Oh, turn on my uh, slideshow if you could. Turn on my slideshow. I've got, uh, I've got too many moving parts here. I've got a microphone, and I've got this, and I've got my clicker. So I'm going to just take a minute, and I'm going to grab the podium. OK. All right, OK. So here we go. Here we go. We're in the, in the book of Matthew. And we're in Matthew chapter 6, and we're discussing the Sermon on the Mount. And I have really enjoyed uh, this study on the Sermon on the Mount. I hope it's been a blessing to you. It has been a blessing to me. And um, the Pharisees were a very interesting lot. Uh, Jesus starts out our portion of Scripture this morning, chapter 6, by saying this. He gives a warning to his listeners to beware. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Because those of you who do such things have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now, in verse 1, 
you will notice that Jesus touches on a couple of ideas here. Number one, the first idea is doing our righteous deeds for the express purposes of being seen by other people. And the second one is one of rewards from God our Father who is in heaven. And so I'm going to begin this morning by, uh, by addressing the first, the first issue or the first idea, doing your, doing your righteous acts in order to be seen by admirers. It, that, is a, that is a temptation. That's somewhat of a, of a seductive temptation to want to be noticed by others for those righteous things that we do. And this can be kind of subtle. And why do we do this? Because in what I have noticed, it is, it's easy to equate success or status based upon the positive feedback that we get from others. It makes us feel wanted. It makes us feel significant. It makes us feel successful. And, and positive feedback, that resonates with our soul because there's something about us that does desire or f uh, approval or favor from others. Um, it makes us feel accepted or validated. And, and I believe, okay, bear with me here, I believe these are, are God-given desires. For instance, for instance, a child, a child naturally desires to please his parents. Now, I know what some of you parents are saying, uh, Brad, I've got a child, right? <laughs> I have one, right? Doesn't want to please me. Well, for the most part, that is true that a child wants to please his parents. In fact, uh, a parent can frustrate a child when a parent does not give the affirmation that a child's heart craves. And sometimes the child will do what? Will engage in errant behavior to get some kind of feedback from mom or dad. So anyway, just throwing that out there. So, and the reason I say this is because I believe that God has hardwired our hearts to want affirmation or approval. Um, oh, how are we doing? Oh, thank you. We need to move it before I hit the uh, flowers. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, God has hardwired our hearts so that we can relate primarily to God in this regard and secondarily to people. God wants us to be in the business of pleasing him as a first priority, as a means of worshiping God. We ought to desire to please God in our endeavor to worship him. Now, getting back to the passage at hand, if you do your righteous deeds in public for the purposes of receiving the attention and the praise from other people, you're not really worshiping God at all, are you? You're worshiping at the altar of popularity or fame or human affirmation because you're doing these things to win not God's favor, but man's favor. In fact, in fact, your desire to win the praise and the attention of other people is, in essence, to set yourself up as that object of worship and adoration, thus pushing God aside and placing you in his rightful position. And this can be, this can be a dangerous life to live, a dangerous life seeking the constant approval of men because men are fallen. We are sinful and we have selfish interests. And so um, be careful. Be careful of the affirmation you get from other people because oftentimes that can be motivated by self-interest. And I want to say this too. Living a life seeking constant approval and affirmation from other people is ultimately a life of fear and frustration. Frustration and fear. Frustration because we never get the affirmation that we demand. And fear, 
Fear because we may, instead of getting that affirmation, we may get rejection instead. Okay? I, in my humble opinion, I think that's what cancel culture is all about, is fear. And it also leads to a life of compromise. You will compromise much to win the favor of people. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would free us from the bondage of approval for men, that we, that we would seek the approval from God. So that's the first item, the item of doing our godly deeds for the purposes of being seen by others. Now, there's a second idea, and that's the one of rewards. Now, some Christians might be averse to the idea of rewards. It may seem like the pursuit of rewards from God is just selfish, in, uh, selfish personal interest packaged with a righteous bow, okay? Furthermore, rewards are that which are earned. And the Christian faith is opposed to earning, right? Well, our justification is opposed to earning. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works. But... But from Jesus' own words, we stand to receive rewards from the Father for our righteous works. And, and that's presented not just here in Matthew chapter 19. I have Matthew chapter 19 here on the screen. But it's also in other locations. The Apostle Paul talks about this. And, and folks, this should resonate again with our souls. We desire to be recognized for a job well done. We, we desire to be recognized for achieving excellence in something. We desire to have a life lived that is celebrated. There's something in us that wants to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and we want this celebration not to last just for a moment. We want this celebration to continue on from all eternity. And this ought to resonate with our hearts, to live a celebrated life. That's what eternity looks like. And so our aim, our aim should be to win the favor of God the Father who is in heaven, not of men and women here on earth, and to strive to secure God's reward so that we can enjoy those rewards for all eternity. Okay, we have talked a lot about verse 1. So we're going to move on to verse 2. And verse 2 and following, okay? Jesus gives us three instances where he applies this. And they are giving to the needy, praying, and fasting. And you're going to notice a pattern here as we go through these verses. If you do your righteous activity in public for the purposes of receiving attention and praise from other people, then their praise is your reward, reward in full. You got what you were truly after. If you do your righteous activities in secret to be seen only by God who sees in secret, then God's favor, a fav favor, favor is your reward. Okay, so that's the pattern. Okay, so moving on, verse 2, with regard to giving to the needy. Now, it appears that the Pharisees, when they gave money, they started to blow trumpets, if you can imagine such a thing. They blew trumpets in the synagogue and in the streets to get the attention, the eyes and ears of everybody. Hello, out there, everybody. Ba -ba -da -da, ba -ba -da -ba. Pharisee Joseph is about to give money to the needy. Ba -ba -da -da. What's going on here? What's, what's wrong with this picture, right? Is, is it a good thing to give to the needy? Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. Is this something that Christians should be doing, giving to the needy? Yeah, that's it. Um, so what's wrong here? By giving to the needy with the wrong heart, that may be a blessing to the needy, but it's not a blessing to the giver, at least not a blessing from God anyway. And why is this? Because, because that gift was given not in service to God, but in service to themselves. They wanted the notice and the attention of a human, human audience, and that's what they got. And so their, the attention they got from their crowd was their reward. 
Now, I've already stated that this is, a, this is a temptation for us. So what's Jesus' remedy? He says this, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, right out of the gate, Jesus seems to be asking for the impossible here. Who here has successfully been able to conceal from your left hand what your right hand is doing? Anyone has been successful at doing that? Right. In order to do that, you would have to sever the left hand from your brain, right? So I, I think Jesus is using hyperbole here. And it's an effective form of speech because this is a, a vivid picture that sticks out in our mind. Um, but we're still left with how do we apply this. Now, I think it's important to say that uh, Jesus' instruction is not intended to force us to sneak around and be absolutely sure no one's watching when we give, right? We're, we're about ready to give, and there's, oh, there's Mrs. Johnson in the corner. I can't give yet. Okay, Mrs. Johnson's gone. Oh, Frank just got into the room. I can't, I can't. I've got to wait. Okay, oh, 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 uh, Mr. Smith, he came into the room. I can't give. All of a sudden, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Johnson says, oh, there's, there's Brad. He wants to give to the needy, but he can't yet because no one's in the room. So... So if I'm sneaking around, I'm almost doing the same thing in reverse, right? Right? So, so what should we do? So what should we do? I think the answer is this. When we give, we should be oblivious to those around us. We should give as if the only eyes that are on us are God's. And God, who is invisible, will reward us for our gift. Okay, the next circumstance is in regard to prayer. When the Pharisees prayed, they prayed in the synagogues and street corners, not because those were the most sensible places to pray, but because they were the most public places to pray. And the attention they received was their reward. And so I think it's important to analyze this a little bit. Is it, is it a good thing to pray? Yes, it's a good thing to pray. Are we commanded to pray? Yes, we're commanded to pray. In fact, we're to pray without ceasing. But prayer is a means by which we have fellowship with God. And so the focus of our souls as we come to God in prayer should not be other people, but should be God with whom we want to fellowship. So what's, what's Jesus' solution here? He says, go into your room and shut the door and pray. Now this raises some questions for us. Is Jesus prohibiting public prayer in this verse? I don't think so. Because when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he prays aloud. He prays in front of people. He prays in front of believers and non-believers. So I don't think Jesus is prohibiting public prayer. However, at the same time, Jesus did often isolate himself to pray. And so how should we practically apply Jesus' instructions here? Well, I think the solution is similar to that with which we saw giving to the needy. When we pray, our focus should be on God, not on those around us. We should pray as if the only eyes that truly matter are God's. Now, I take this with a grain of salt. If I stand up here and pray, and you're an English-speaking crowd, and I start praying in Mandarin, that's not going to edify anybody, right? So, so I do need to be aware of who I'm praying in front of in a public prayer. However, primarily I want to please, I want to please God and honor Him when I pray. So sometimes we will pray in public settings. Sometimes we'll pray all by ourselves. Sometimes we'll pray out loud. And sometimes we will pray silently. But however we pray... When we pray, we need to be mindful of God first. And what's the reward for prayer? The reward for prayer is God's answer, right? Okay, verse 16. You'll notice I'm skipping down to verse 16. The uh, passages between verses 7 and 15 is the Lord's Prayer. And we're not going to discard this. We're going to cover that next time, which will be after Easter. So uh, here sometime in April, we'll cover the Lord's Prayer, okay? Okay, so if you're worried that we missed that, no need to worry. You can settle back down. It's going to be okay. 
Uh, so verse 16 gives us the third and final case, and this is in regards to fasting. Uh, and, and I think the topic of fasting requires us to a, do a little bit more investigation. Uh, giving to the needy and praying, those seem to be very common and well-known Christian disciplines. However, fasting is much less so. And so let's ask ourselves some questions. What does it mean to fast? What is fasting? Well, in the most simple way possible, fasting is really a self-denial. And this is a passage from Leviticus chapter 23 in reference to the Day of Atonement, which was the day when the high priest once a year went into the Holy of Holies to, to give atonement for the sins of the entire nation. And this phrase here, afflict yourself, is sometimes interpreted deny yourself or humble yourself. And in this instance, it's a den denial from food or to afflict oneself with hunger. And this is typically how we understand fasting with respect to denying yourself food. In fact, this term breakfast, this fast in that, that's, that's to break the fast that you experienced overnight without eating anything. But a fast can more broadly be taken as, uh, as, a, as a denial from anything. In fact, in fact, one could say that the entirety of the Christian life is a fast. Notice what Jesus says later in the, in the uh, Gospel of Matthew. Here is in verse 16. Our walk with Christ is one of self-denial. We're to, to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow him. So this, uh, this concept of fasting should not be so foreign to us after all. I believe perhaps it's foreign to us because we do live in a, a self-serving society. Is that true? We tend to live in a society where pleasure and comfort and convenience, those are things to be expected in my life. And this idea of denying myself, well, I'm not so sure about that. But denial is part of the Christian walk. And so now we know what fasting is. The next question is why? Why do we fast? It's a, it's a means of humbling yourself to the Lord. That's why we fast. Uh, and we humble ourselves for the Lord either for just the purposes of being humble before our God or, or we're experiencing great burden and we are seeking God's direction or God's intervention or God's uh, or God's guidance on something. Uh, an example of this is during the time of the judges. The tribe of Benjamin was in rebellion from the rest of the tribes of Israel. And so the remaining tribes of Israel rose up in battle against Benjamin. And the first day of battle, Benjamin routs of the other tribes of Israel. And in response, the tribes of Israel, they fasted before the Lord their God to seek his direction. And so this brings up the last question, when? When should we fast? The only prescribed fast in the Old Testament is the one we just saw on the Day of Atonement. Now, national leaders could call for a fast, and that's kind of what we see here in Judges, and individuals could fast as they saw fit. I think an example of this is uh, Hannah, the uh, mother of Samuel. She fasted before the Lord as she prayed and cried out to him for a son. Now, later on, the Jews observed additional fasts during the exile, meaning the 70 years in Babylon. And I'm assuming this was to humble themselves before the Lord with the hope of restoration. But that by the time we get to Jesus' day, the Pharisees had taken fasting to a new level. It had become a, a weekly ritual. And some fasted as many as twice a week. And it became a ritual, and like many rituals... Uh, it became empty of its original passion. Instead, it just became a badge of godliness. And to be a badge of godliness, of course, you sometimes need to, um, you need to help people know you're fasting. And to help people out, the Pharisees would intentionally look gloomy 
and disfigure their faces and, and attempt to display, display sorrow and pain. Oh, I'm fasting. Can't you? And with the expectation that others would see them and say, boy, those Pharisees are awfully pious. Do you see they're fasting right now because their faces are all contorted and they look awful. <laughs> So like blowing of trumpets and when they gave to the needy and standing in prominent places when they prayed, all this was for show so that the onlookers would be impressed by their level of piety. And the praise and the affirmation and the attention they gained was their reward. And again, fasting is or was and still is a means of humbling ourselves before the Lord, coming to him with a deep need and seeking his guidance or intervention. And that God would accept your expression of humility or meet your need, that is the reward. That is the reward we're seeking through fasting. And so what is Jesus' antidote to all this? Well, Jesus says this, don't let on that you're fasting. Instead of contorting your face to make yourself a public spectacle or allowing blood to gush out of your nose or whatever, freshen up. Look your best. No one can see hunger. This should be a fairly easy thing to conceal, so keep it secret. And that which God sees in secret, he will reward. Okay, one last thing. One last thing. You might remember when we looked at Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus encourages us to let our light shine before men so that they may see our good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Remember that passage? I have it up there in case you forgot it. Here, in uh, chapter 6, verse 1, he's saying that we should beware of practicing our good deeds before people to be seen by them. So how do we harmonize this? Here's my solution. Jesus is not restricting us from practicing our good deeds before others. Okay, he's not restricting us from practicing our good deeds before others. He's saying that we should beware. We should beware of the situation because it presents to us a temptation to do these things to be noticed by others. The purpose of our good works is that people may see them and praise God our Father in heaven, not praise the Father's children here on earth. Do you see the difference there? So what's our takeaway this morning? There's several. First, beware. Beware of the temptation of doing your godly needs, uh, your godly deeds rather, to elevate your religious status in the eyes of other people. Beware. This is a dangerous trap. Living a life seeking constant approval, affirmation from other people is ultimately a life of frustration and fear. Frustration that you never receive the affirmation that you demand and fear that others will, instead of affirming you, will reject you. And it's also a life of compromise. Second, giving to the needy, praying and fasting are all good things. And we're to practice these disciplines as part of our walk with Christ. Now, Christ does not reward these good things done with selfish intent. We desire to be recognized. We desire to be recognized by God. And, of course, we want a celebrated life. Our hearts long to hear from the Father, well done, good and faithful servant. And we want to enjoy a celebrated life for all eternity. And so, and so our aim... Our aim should be to win the favor of God the Father and to serve him. And so as we do our righteous deeds, may we first seek to honor and please our Lord and Savior before anyone else. May God bless you as you serve him.